Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, as always, and today I'm joined by Dr. Manvir Singh. He just graduated with a PhD in Human Evolutionary Biology from Harvard University with a focus on cognitive and evolutionary anthropology. His research program aims to explain why societies develop complex recurrent traditions such as shamanism, witchcraft, origin myths, property rights, sharing norms, lullabies, dance, music, and gods, as these have appeared in all types of societies across the globe, from nomadic hunter-gatherer bands to complex industrial mega-urbanized states. So, Dr. Singh, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. And by the way, congratulations on your recent PhD. So, Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be on. Okay, great. So, um, you, I know that you do field work with the Mentawai people. Is that the correct pronunciation? Mentawai? Yeah, Mentawai. Mentawai people of Sibirut Island in Indonesia. So, could you tell us in general terms what is the kind of society that we are talking about? Do they have any peculiarities? I mean, basically, why was it that you decided to study this uh, society? Okay, yeah. So, since 2014, I have been working with the Mentawai people. Um, yeah. They are rainforest horticulturalists, so they mostly grow sago, they also grow taro, bananas, mangoes. Um, I originally decided to work there because of this vigorous indigenous culture, especially the religion and the systems of justice. So those were two topics that I was very interested in understanding. How do um, how does small-scale religion work? How does justice work in small-scale societies? Um, and I was especially interested in topics, like you mentioned, like shamanism, like witchcraft, like animism. But another reason that I went to Siberut in particular and worked with the Mentawe is that, so Siberut Island has all of these rivers uh, covering it, and each river has a uh, set of communities who speak slightly different dialects from those of other rivers. So yeah. you travel across the islands and you visit these different cultural regions where they have different tattoos, different taboo system, different dialects. And so it almost provides this interesting uh, natural laboratory of cultural evolution where you can identify which aspects of culture are stable and which are more likely to vary, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so, so it's basically because of the geography that uh, tends to separate some of the groups of people or communities and then you can understand a little bit better, for example, how they uh, in separate places develop different practices. Is that it? Well, yeah, so more or less the the story is that they came to one of these rivers and then they spread mm -hmm. uh, across the island. And yeah. these river valleys are separated by higher like, forested hills. Um, mm -hmm. And historically, s some of these communities would be uh, amicable uh, between rivers, across rivers, but many of them were aggressive and there would be head hunting, for example, and so they wouldn't really get along. And so you, then you can see as they, for instance, migrated which aspects of their cultural systems remain the same and which were more likely to vary. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, what, in one of our projects, which we might talk about, we looked at this uh, punitive water spirit. There's a belief that if you don't share, there's this water spirit that will attack you. Yeah. So we studied it throughout the southern part of the island. And in different parts of the island, people imagine it to be different. They have different origin myths. But everywhere, it punishes people who don't share. And everywhere, it's appeased in shamanic ceremonies. So you can kind of get this functional core. And then you see all of these other elements that, that are much more variable around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. So it's basically also a way of 
having a, a sort of natural experiment where you can understand a little bit better when people migrate from one group to another or from one place to the other, the sort of practices that they take with them or that they adopt? Is that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when culture transmits, when people migrate, what are those aspects of culture that that they that are the most important that that they reproduce most reliably mm -hmm. uh, and since we're already talking about the mental why uh, what were the specific aspects of their sociality or their cultural practices that you focused your work the most on yeah so in my research i focused especially on different aspects of religion. So they have this very interesting shamanic institution. There it's called there are these individuals who are called Sikere. So they they heal individuals, they enter trance. It's like a special class of individuals. They're believed to be fundamentally or essentially different from the rest of the community. So I studied that institution. I studied their taboos. They have an indigenous system of justice, uh, mostly surrounding fines. Um, so you know, penalties, payments and penalties. I studied that and then I studied taboos. Those were my main topics and those continue to be my main topics. There are also other interesting things. Um, you know, I so I, when I do research there, I live there and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on that you just encounter or confront incidentally, but those are the topics that I had concerted uh, research on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that with the mental why you also studied uh, their gods that are considered small gods in the sense that, uh, I mean, I guess that when we talk about big gods, or at least when I talked with people from the cognitive science of religion, when we mention big gods, we are talking about gods that are uh, moralizing beings, right? Su supernatural beings. But with the mental why, as far as I know, you arrive at that, that the conclusion that it is not always the case that small gods are non-moralizing. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned earlier this water spirit. It's most often thought of as a crocodile spirit, Sikoinen, uh, Sikamainen. So um, what was really striking is I arrived in Mentawe, and there's this anthropological truism that you hear quite often that gods in horticultural societies or hunter-gatherer societies do not care about moral ends. And I arrived there, and I very I saw quite quickly that there is this belief that this water spirit attacks you if you don't share meat and that uh, shamans interact with it. They invite it. They have to take it down to the river. It was uh, quite a salient part of how people understand illness work, illness to work, and how they understand morality. So we had this uh, pretty intensive investigation of people's beliefs about it. I, I examined healing ceremonies, I conducted these interviews about healing ceremonies, I conducted interviews about Siko Oinen, and what we found is that um, it indeed does care about moral ends, it cares uh, about um, one in particular, it attacks you, it causes illness if you don't share meat. So it is an example of a moralistic concern, um, but it's, it's different from the large gods, the big gods of large scale societies in that its jurisdiction is very small, so it doesn't care if you're mean to someone or, or whatever. Um, and also its moral scope is, is quite small. So it only cares if you share with your clan members, fellow clan members. It doesn't care if you don't share with someone in a different community or in a different river. Uh, and its powers are also very limited, so it can't read people's minds. It can typically only watch you if it's if it's sitting in your house. People kind of imagine it to be uh, like a shape-shifting, invisible crocodile being that crawls into their house. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we found that it was moralistic, but we found that it was much less powerful and much less generally moralistic than than these big gods. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why it is still considered a small god. 
right. Right, right, right. Because it has these reduced powers and this reduced moral jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, I mean, it, it was this a uh, new finding? I mean, before, before you did that study, you studied that particular god from the Mentawai people. Uh, did people, were people already aware that perhaps there were some small gods like this one that were also moralizing or was moralization, let's say, attributed uh, always to big gods in, in more complex agriculture-based societies, for example? So the question was, did people be before this study think that small gods were moralistic and punitive, right? That was the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it depends on who you ask. Um, so like I was saying, there were these, there were a couple projects, one for example by Chris Bohm, and then Joseph Watts and colleagues coded all kinds of ethnographies. And those, uh, in both of those projects, in their surveys of older ethnographic material, they did report that there were supernatural forces in these small-scale societies that care about uh, social behavior, some moralistic domain, and that their moral jurisdiction is much smaller than that of these large-scale gods. Um, but there hadn't been a really concerted effort to, to characterize these beliefs. You know, it was mostly on the basis of old ethnographer reports or old missionary reports. Um, and so our project was, I'm always careful to, to make some kind of declarative or absolutist claim, but I, I think our project is important because it is one of the, you know, most systematic investigations of what these gods actually look like in these, in these communities. Um, and something that I think really benefits our project is that we looked at these, these gods as they exist across these sites. Uh, and we also linked it to old original missionary reports because it's easy, for instance, to critique some of these older ethnographic materials that an ethnographer got from living in a community and say, no, that just came from Christianity. Like, how can you be sure that that is indigenous to this society? Mm -hmm. um, but so we had the benefit of studying all of these communities throughout southern Sibirut um, that have, you know, a deep shared history, but more recently have had very different interactions with missionaries, with the state. Some of them are quite remote. Some of them have been at the center of uh, outside transformative processes. Um, and then we also found m like an early missionary report from the 1920s of a Dutch missionary who visited the island and recorded some beliefs. And across the sites and consistent with the older materials, you find this belief in this punitive water spirit associated with crocodiles. Um, so all of those resources, you know, the cross site uh, investigation, I think gives us the, the strongest um, body of work about one of these small gods. But, you know, it, it definitely matches some of the stuff that Joseph Watts and colleagues and Chris Bohm found in their surveys of ethnographies that these spirits do seem to care about moral jurisdictions, but their claims are quite restricted. Uh, one final thing, like I said, it depends on who you ask. So there are many people, you know, we can look through some recent review articles, for example, that come out in Trends in Cognitive Science or that come out in Nature or whatever. And people love this claim, like, uh, moral supernatural forces are only recent in human history, only emerged with the, the emergence of large scale states. So I think like you find that there's that nature article by White House at all, it starts with a, a statement like that, or Pascal Boyer and Nicolas Bauma had a, an article in Trends in Cognitive Science that starts out with something similar. It's, it's just this truism that um, people often take for granted. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I'm going to ask you one question and then a follow-up. So just to understand this a little bit better, uh, these mental Y communities are composed of uh, how many people? How many people? What is the average number of people there? Um, so the way that the communities work is that people live in people are members of clans. Okay. Um, and so historically, you would just live with your clan. You would live in a longhouse. 
um, or in one of the houses near the, the longhouse, and that would be your residential unit. That would be your identity. Mm-hmm. Now, and so, and then there would be a number of clans that live along one of these rivers, um, and they would interact. They would, I don't know, for instance, like intermarry and visit each other. Um, but now what the government has done is that it has built a series of settlement villages along each of these rivers. Um, and the settlement village, they build houses, uh, and then they, they ask the Mentawi people to move into those houses. Um, so right now they have like a mixed residence. They will live in these long houses. They'll also live in these residential villages, but increasingly they're, they're moving very fast to these, to these government settlement villages. And that's been going on for decades now. Um, but so a government settlement village could have like 300 people, um, a clan, or I guess it can have between like 300 and uh, maybe a couple more hundred. The one I work in, Butu, is one of the, the smallest, and I think it officially has about 280 people. Um, but there are a number of these these settlement villages on the river. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. I've, I've asked you that because now I want to ask if you think that the fact that those communities have these small gods that are also moralizing gods would have something to do with the fact that they have a number that is uh, higher than the typical hunter-gatherer tribe, for example. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Because I do. Yeah, It could be the case that after we pass a certain threshold in terms of number of people, then it, it is not enough for people to monitor the behavior of others. I mean, they can't. They can no longer keep track of all people that live there. Do you understand yeah, yeah. Where, I, where I'm trying to arrive at? I get what you're saying. Yeah, you're saying that as a community get, gets larger, larger reciprocity and reputation and other traditional mechanisms might not work as well, and so maybe then you need these supernatural forces. Yeah. Um, well, so I would say, again, that traditionally the residential unit is the clan, which is much smaller than the government village. It, it would really vary, but it might vary between, you know, a longhouse might have, like, I don't want to say any declarative numbers, but it would be in the tens, um, at most maybe a hundred. But mm-hmm. that would that seems very large as soon as I say it. Um, I would imagine I'd, we should look at the old ethnographic stuff, or I can like go into my own documents. But maybe sixty adults or twenty adults. You know, they're much smaller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so some clans are very, very small. I mean, clans disappear. You know, they might have, they might just be like a couple um, brothers and their wives and their children. So you wouldn't say that the fact that they have these small gods that are moralizing at the same time have anything to do with the number of people that are part of the clan, for example, or? Because I'm only asking you this because since we usually associate big moralizing gods with large societies that are usually based on agriculture, right? I mean, like chief them states and so on. I was just trying to understand if there could be a link between the number of people that compose a particular society, being it a clan, a tribe, or whatever, and the need of having this sort of supernatural being that is monitoring the behavior of all people that are part of the society. Yeah, okay, so I have two, I have two thoughts in response to that. Yeah. The first is that the, so in Mentawe, if we think about this again, Mentawe, the crocodile spirit, the water spirit, Sikaoinen, or Sikameinen, it has many names, but let's call it Sikameinen. Yeah. Sikameinen um, punishes people who don't share meat. Mm-hmm. Um, and the striking thing is that there are some ways that I can get and share meat that are very enforceable. So if, um, if, if my, uh, 
child is getting married, for instance, and our family and their family exchange pigs or exchange gifts, and you know, the one of the families gives a lot of pigs, then everyone knows Manvir has pigs, like we should be expecting those pigs. And if I don't share those pigs, then it is clear that I didn't do so because you know they're expecting it. And now these mechanisms like reputation or reciprocity should kick in. So so those traditional mechanisms that we think about um, will still play will still contribute to some kinds of sharing. But there are other kinds of sharing that I think are much harder to enforce. Um, so one of them might be private hunting. So I, you know, for example, we have um, a long house and a number of small houses surrounding it. Mm -hmm. I live in one of the houses with my spouse. We, me and my brother or me and my son go out into the forest. We kill a deer. Um, we can come back and we can just surreptitiously eat that. Uh, as soon as possible. We can even maybe, like, maybe not a deer, but, you know, let's say we get a monkey, we can create a small fire in the woods and we can butcher it and we can eat it secretly. Um, so that is a form of, uh, that's an instance where I would acquire meat, but it's much harder to enforce my sharing of that meat. Another one that people would talk about a lot is just like uh, you know, we, we get meat, we all eat it, we're living in the longhouse, and then we store it above the fire where the smoke preserves it. Mm -hmm. Now, someone can go in when no one is watching, go into that kitchen and nibble on that smoked meat. Um, and yeah. so, and that's another instance where it's hard to enforce. So I only mention that because these are these two that over there, I think Sikoinen, I think your intuition is correct that there are some instances that are hard to enforce and Sikoinen is enforcing them. I think it's less about the group size in that context and more about what are the particular variables of the context that allow it to be enforced. Nevertheless, I think you're onto something with thinking about the scale of the society, the scale of cooperation and the God. So the important thing in Mentawe is that on a daily basis, I'm only really cooperating with my close clan members. They're my kin and they're my regular reciprocal partners. And so insofar as we have a punitive spirit, mm -hmm. um, that should only care about me cooperating with clan members. That's the only, that's the, the salient important aspect of cooperative life. If it's a large scale state in contrast, where you have many people and not cooperating with anonymous strangers on a daily basis you know we need markets we need feuds to not break out in the middle of our of our small proto city or whatever then it's much more important to have a punitive force that is uh, whose moral jurisdiction is much broader who doesn't only care that you're loyal to your family but cares that you're nice to your neighbors etc do you know what I mean Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I understand now. Okay, so uh, j just to change topics now, but since we are focusing still on religion, uh, I want to ask you, uh, you mentioned that the mental why have shaman, uh, shamans, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so uh, could you tell us what the shamanism really about? And is it a fo also a form of religion or is it classified as something else? Yeah, so shamanism, there is like a lot of quibbling about what is technically shamanism. The definition that I find useful and that many people find useful is that uh, shamans are specialists or practitioners who enter trance, and I'll define trance in a second, who enter trance um, and in trance engage with some unseen reality and through that engagement provide services like healing or divination or you know the change of weather. So you, Ricardo, you want to change the weather, you come to me, Manvir, I'm the shaman, I enter trance, I talk to some god who we can't see and then I, I stop the rain for the next couple days. Um, so your second question was, is it a form of religion? Is it something else? I think that that just, seems like it just depends on how you define religion. Um, so I think shamanism, to just answer your question a, a bit more thoughtfully, I think shamanism is a combination of magic and religion. So it's magical insofar as it's um, it's instrumental, it's pragmatic, it's helping us apparently overcome uncertainty. It's religious uh, given that it's about engagement with invisible supernatural beings. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's basically a mix between religion and uh, magical thinking. Is that it, or? Yeah, I think that's one way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, how did shamanism evolve in human societies? I mean, b basically, I guess that the most important question here, since we're talking about the cultural evolution of a particular thing, is to understand what is the function that shamanism serves in society, right? Yeah, well, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, I I would be careful, and we can talk about this about what we really mean by function, because I think function. Some people make assumptions when they hear what when they hear that word function. Okay. <laughs> um, not to be like really academic and nitpicky, but so um, I think many people will argue that shamanism exists for many reasons. The argument that I have made in the literature and in my research is essentially that shamanism is a very cognitively appealing means of controlling uncertain outcomes. Um, so I want to heal illness, I want to change the weather, I want to do well in business. There are essentially magical specialists who are competing to provide me those services and that competition among these specialists and my selection of those methods that seem to work the best mm -hmm. drives this this cultural evolution of a practice that is very appealing um, that essentially hacks my cognitive architecture and tickles it in all kinds of ways to convince me that it is the best method of controlling these uncertain outcomes and so we can go into what that means more or less um but that is that is the argument that i've made that it's it's a highly cognitively appealing means of controlling uncertain outcomes mm -hmm. so that's about shamanism and what about witches and sorcerers i mean where do beliefs about these kinds of people stem from and why are people afraid of certain kinds of people and they label them as witches and sorcerers and things like that yeah so um the when we use the word sorcerer so some people will think about sorcerer as equivalent to shaman but the way that yeah. i've used it and I think the publication you're referring to is that a sorcerer is someone who's believed to, to use magical methods, voodoo dolls, et cetera, mm -hmm. to harm me. So I get sick, you know, my mom dies in a car crash. I shouldn't say that. Some, that's a terrible example, but um, <laughs> something bad happens, you know, a, a car crashes into my house, whatever, there's misfortune. And I suspect that fellow group members are using evil methods. So a sorcerer is someone who's like using magic and a witch is someone who not only causes that harm, but also is heinous. They eat babies, they fly, they collect in graveyards and conspire and have orgiastic festivals and invite the devil and fornicate with the devil. You know, something much more outrageous, but at the same time also the root of misfortune. So those seem to reflect, uh, we can think about it as, as uh, coming from three processes. So one of them is and we can dive into them more, but one is pretty coarsely just an exp explanation of misfortune. So humans seem to be endowed with this psychology under which circum circumstances or in certain circumstances, we are predisposed to think that um, other people are the reason something went wrong. So I'm in a coffee shop, I leave my wallet on the table, I go to the bathroom, I come back. Under some circumstances, I'm especially predisposed to think that someone else stole it. I'm distrustful of the people around me. I feel persecuted. We have this kind of adaptive paranoia is the argument. So the idea is that under those conditions under which this adaptive paranoia is triggered psychologically, um, explanations that point to fellow group members as causing my misfortune are very compelling. They're very plausible seeming, um, especially if we live in a world where we believe in magic. So. Mm -hmm. uh, one way to think about these beliefs is that they're, they're especially compelling explanations of why things go wrong. Um, the other big process is that they are, and this is about witches in particular, but they are especially 
um, effective narratives for demonizing someone and for urging other people to attack them for justifying mistreatment. So let's say, you know, I have it out for, I have it out for someone, I have it out for Ed, um, and something goes wrong, I can be like, yo, not only did Ed cause that, not only is Ed, you know, a sorcerer, but also Ed has every trait that, that is the most vile and the most dangerous. Ed is a part of a society that conspires at night and is planning to kill us. And in that society, they eat babies and they fornicate with menstruating squirrels. Um, mm -hmm. And so the argument is essentially that, um, you know, there, we have these explanations for misfortune. We have uh, these demonizing narratives. Separately, those can produce their own kinds of outcomes. So propaganda campaigns very often use these same kind of demonizing narratives. If you look at like how the Indonesian government uh, labeled communists in 1965, it's very witchy. If you look at how early Christians demonized Jews or Jews demonized Christians or Christians demonized heretic groups or the uh, Tutsis demonized the Hutus, it's very, very similar, you know, outrageous and, and existentially threatening. Um, but so that's the argument. The argument is that because as these processes occur around the world, they convergently produce these very similar beliefs that are that are serving these different kind of subjective functions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, would you say that all of these beliefs, particularly the ones about witches, have to do with people's fear that uh, what other people, if other people desire that something bad happens to them and resort to certain techniques, certain processes, then that has uh, an effective uh, effect, let's say, uh, on their lives. Is that it? Yeah. So, like, I think we are especially predisposed and, and if you think about it, during our evolutionary history, it's very useful to think, okay, something went wrong, you know, my baby died last night, um, and person X in my group has hated me for the last week. It, it, it seems to benefit individuals on average from being a bit too suspicious from not being suspicious enough. So we, we have this kind of adaptive, like I mentioned, this adaptive paranoia. Um, because you don't want to you know, to live in a group and people are attacking you and you're just not suspecting it. It allows you to be much more easily exploited. So the idea is that we have this kind of bet hedging psychology that is a bit trigger happy under certain circumstances of, of suspecting other people. Yeah. And so if I'm in that context and I'm consistently, you know, something is being going wrong and I'm predisposed to think about people who are envious or people who have expressed hatred towards me, um, then these explanations are highly, highly compelling, even though they might seem, you know, from other perspectives to be a bit, a bit dodgy or a bit strange. Um, and the striking thing is that they still manifest in contemporary society. They just take different forms. So people might be especially distrustful of the government, or they might be especially distrustful of certain business individuals, and they will subscribe to conspiratorial theories that connect the misfortunes in their lives, the AIDS pandemic, you know, a, a particular plane crash, to these distrusted parties, often through mechanisms that might otherwise seem to be a bit elaborate or, or under, under uh, unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, seems it's, like it's, it, it's as if people feel the need to attribute some sort of agency or uh, identify an agent that has caused that particular kind of bad situation or bad happening in their lives, right? Right, right, exactly. And they're especially predisposed to think about that if they feel persecuted, if they feel distrustful, and the more significant that event is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so Can going a little bit back to religion, uh, I know that you also study the uh, phenomenon that is very interesting, that is religious self-denial. So wh what is it about and why does it exist? Okay, yeah, so consistently across societies, um, religion, as a part of religious belief, people deny themselves food, sex, social contact, 
Um, and that happens among lay people. So, you know, we might go, for example, we might have a month where we fast or we might have several weeks where we don't have sex or whatever. But then religious practitioners, uh, so shamans, priests, holy kings, monks, will often observe these to, a, to an extreme extent. So in Mentawe, there's this joke where when you become a shaman, your wife becomes your sister. The idea being that, like, you, you can you're sometimes allowed to have sex with her but there are many constraints you can't have sex during any ceremony you can't have sex if you're healing someone etc um so this question of why it exists is something that i have have been puzzled puzzling over and have done some research on so in mentawe we looked at it with shamans in particular so over there like i mentioned shamans have to observe taboos on uh, in all kinds of circumstances. When you're becoming initiated, you have to observe all of these taboos. During ceremonial periods, you have to observe taboos. And then once you become a shaman, there are certain taboos that you have to observe forever. You can't eat gibbons, you can't eat the white morph of the Simokobu monkey, you can't eat eels, flounders, mm -hmm. uh, a, a certain squirrel. So there are a couple hypotheses that people have put forward to explain this phenomenon. One is what they call cooperative costly signaling. So the idea there is that through self-denying, I signal to other people that I am cooperative. Um, maybe it's because I signal that I'm committed to the religion or the group. Um, another one is what Joe Henrik has proposed, and he refers to it as a credibility enhancing display. Mm -hmm. So if I observe some kind of costly behavior that signals to you that I believe in this religion, you know, I, um, the extreme example that he likes to offer sometimes is martyrdom. Someone who kills themselves, who, who dies for the religion, clearly seems to believe in some God, or, or at least the evidence that they believe in that God is much stronger than if they didn't kill themselves for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that hypothesis is that monks, shamans, holy kings, priests um, self-deny so as to indicate to other people or, or convince other people that they believe in these religious beliefs and help these beliefs kind of transmit through a network. Mm -hmm. The final hypothesis, uh, which is something I've thought about and which connects to my other work on shamanism, is that through self-denial, I at least intuitively um, become a different kind of human. I become different from the normal individual by denying myself these hedonic ends. Um, and that makes it more uh, plausible to other people, to myself, that I have special powers that, or that I uh, can engage with a, a supernatural entity in some kind of way. So the idea there is that shamans who self-deny are essentially more com more successful in the market for magic they other people are more convinced that this person has the powers they claim mm -hmm. so um we i've run a number of studies on the internet and in mentawe in mentawe what we did is we just presented participants with these um with an experiment to look at what are their inferences about shamans who self-deny. Mm -hmm. And something that was kind of frustrating for me, we essentially found that they infer everything. They infer that they're more cooperative, they're more trustworthy, they believe more in their religious system, they are um, more different from normal humans, they have more supernatural powers. Um, so at least the, the tentative conclusion I've come to right now is that maybe you know it's consistent with all of them, Mm -hmm. um, when we run it with India, we actually get different results. And when we run it with people in the United States, we get different results. But um, but it's, yeah, I, I think the, the important point that at least I've wanted to make and that I thought was important is that in the cognitive science of religion or the evolutionary study of religion, people really focus on this idea of cooperativeness that religious self-denial and any religious costly behavior is a signal of cooperativeness. Um, so what I think our research shows is that actually the story might be much more complex. There might be this other stuff going on about belief or, or difference. Um, and there are other reasons I think that those are important. Like historically, when you, when you just read how people describe self-denial, people very often describe self-denial as pushing you or pulling you or like placing you in a different kind of state. They think about it as transformative in this kind of way.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, because some of the audience might not be familiar with some of the uh, terms that you used you talk at a certain point there, you talked about credibility enhancing display that uh, displays that usually the acronym is CRED, right, or CREDS. Uh, the, so those are basically any sort of behavior usually associated with religion that people exhibit that uh, that uh, incur some sort of significant cost for uh, to for them to uh, and usually it is done in a public space for other people to see and for them to transmit the idea that they are really committed and that other people can trust that they are really part of the group and they can rely on them, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially any behavior that would not be sensible were you not to hold the belief that you claim. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's say I'm like, Ricardo, you should eat this mushroom. You would be like, how do I know? I say, Ricardo, you should eat this mushroom. This is not going to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and now, if I take a bite of that mushroom, that signals to you, oh, Manvir believes what he's saying, because that would not be sensible were I not to hold that belief. It's yeah, yeah just any behavior that, mm -hmm. that becomes reasonable uh, only when you have the belief that you're claim, claiming. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask you about your work on music and song, but just before we get into that, just one general question, and since we're talking about aspects of human sociality like religion, witchcraft, and so on, uh, w uh, you also studied the role that self-interest plays in the design of social rules. Could you tell us about that? Because it's very interesting that when we think about social rules, we usually do not associate self-interest as something that might play a role in, let's say, building up those, those same rules, right? Yeah, so one argument that we, that my colleagues and I have been making, so I've made this especially with Luke Lowacki and Richard Rangham, has been the argument that to explain why societies on any scale have the rules that we do, um, and this has especially been for evolutionary anthropologists uh, and cultural evolutionists um, and might be clear to other people. But the argument that we've been making is that uh, we should take into account uh, that people are trying to like create rules that are ultimately in their self-interest and they sh are trying to um, they have like some limited reason or rationality to try to design or craft those rules. Um, so one example that there, we have tried to apply this to a number of questions or a number of domains, but a very simple one is this question of how do you have, where do cooperative rules come from in societies? How do we have institutions that create group level benefits? Mm -hmm. And some people have argued for processes like cultural group selection um, or other processes that seem to at least sensibly limit the role of the individual, of individual agency and individual self-interest. And so we have argued that uh, another major contributor is essentially um, people either consensually or coercively creating self-interested rules that then incidentally produce group level benefits. So this is um, pretty well accepted or acknowledged in political science with the idea of the stationary bandit. Are you familiar with that model? Uh, this, no, no. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah. So there is this um, model presented by uh, this economist or political scientist. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce his first name, but it's something like Manker Olson. It might be like Munchor. I think it's Manker Olson. And he essentially says that imagine you have a number of communities and you have a bandit and the bandit comes into one community and they extract as much as they can and then they go to the next community and they extract as much as they can. This is what he calls the roving bandit. The roving bandit is only in it for themselves and they end up being predatory and extractive. Mm -hmm. He says, then let's imagine a stationary bandit. This is a bandit who comes into a society. They have the capacity to be extractive and to you know, take as much as they want, but they're stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, and because they're stuck there, their interest now overlaps with the longer term interest of their group. And so, 
uh, it's in their interest if they want to, to extract benefits. They don't want to completely debilitate this community. They don't want to take everything up such that it dies. They uh, might want to help spur growth. You know, they might provide roads or might provide other public goods, or they might say, stop feuding. You know, they might punish people who are who are constantly bickering or uh, st stop cycles of violence. And you see that, for instance, with colonial powers. There are many reasons to cr critique colonial powers, but one striking thing is that when colonial powers come in to a place where you otherwise have feuding and constant bickering, one of their first things is like, we need to put a stop to that. It's much easier to rule a place if it's harmonious. Um, so that's the the argument of uh, Olson's stationary bandit, that when you're when a bandit, when an individual who can extract is stuck in a place, they will create group level, group beneficial institutions to some extent. And so we have been trying to apply that to think about uh, the evolution of cooperative norms in human societies. Uh, where do, um, you know, institutions that promote engagement in warfare come from? Or where do, um, like, institutions for controlling common goods come from? And it might just be very often individuals bartering or bargaining with each other or individuals creating these institutions in a top-down way. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, I... I think it's. I think other processes are, of course, important. I don't want to deny other processes, but I think there's good reason to believe that these are important contributors. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting. So let's now move on to talking about music. So first of all, and just to make sure, music is a human universal, right? We find music in every society that we have already studied or, or not. Yeah, so in, in our project, in fact, we I think ours is the, the biggest investigation of the universality of music. And we looked at 315 societies in the ethnographic record, from Babylonians to the Mormons, and we find music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, but um, uh, all societies have music, but uh, the traits that go associated with music vary across societies. I mean, there are some similarities and some differences. So what are some of the main aspects where music is similar across societies and the ones where it differs the most? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. That's a question that I've been interested in for a while. So um, for the last five and a half years, I've been working, especially with Luke Lowacki and Sam Mayer on this project that we call the Natural History of Song. And so in that project, we created two databases. One is a database of ethnographic material. So this is every description of song in the ethnographic description of 60 human societies that cover human global geographic diversity from the Koreans to the Andaman Islanders to the Tlingit to the Amhara of Ethiopia. And then we also built a discography. So um, we split the world into 30 regions. From every region, we got an indigenous field recording of a dance song, a healing song, a love song, and a lullaby. So it includes songs of horticulturalists, hunter-gatherers, agriculturalists, pastoralists. And we were interested in precisely this question that you just enumerated. What is similar, what is universal, and what is different? Mm -hmm. So um, in the ethnography, we can think about the behavioral or social context of music. And um, we study that in two ways. One, we just simply looked, so we probed or scoured the literature for hypotheses that music is supposed to be consistently associated with some behavior. So someone might say, around the world, people use music in warfare. Around the world, people use music in lullabies. Around the world, people use music in healing, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so we listed 20 of these behaviors, and then we used different techniques for looking at whether they are especially associated with music. So if they, in the ethnographic text, appear with music more often than would be expected uh, if they were just randomly uh, appearing. Um, and so what we found is that across societies, and you know, it varies, there are complexities to this, but essentially music reliably pops up in this across the 20 contexts that we looked at. So for each of these 20 contexts, we found a signal 
in our global database that music is, is associated with that. So we found that music is associated with healing, dance, lullabies, uh, play, greeting visitors, warfare, processions. Um, the essential idea is that music suffuses social life, mm -hmm. um, but it does so similarly, at least in these ways, that there are certain behaviors where people feel compelled or motivated or inspired to accompany music into them. We also found that uh, music varies most along three dimensions, or there, there are three dimensions that explain global variation in musical behavior. Arousal, religiosity, oh my God, and formality. Mm -hmm. So a musical event will exist somewhere in that three-dimensional space. Um, and we found that variation on these dimensions, uh, that variation was there was much more variation within societies than between societies. Mm -hmm. So societies essentially, in a very similar way, sampled across these dimensions, if you know what I mean. And a, a song of, of average arousal or average formality or average religi religiosity would not be strange in any of the 60 societies that we looked at. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are some of the ways in which the behavior of music is similar. And what we have also looked at is, um, do songs that share behavioral functions, dance songs, lullabies, healing songs, do they exhibit common uh, musical features? So is there something that makes a dance song a dance song? Mm -hmm. And so we use this discography and we analyze it in all kinds of ways. We played it for people on the internet. We did other kinds of analyses. And what we found was that across societies, uh, the behavioral function of the song does predict its musical features. So there is this relationship between song function and song form, but it is strongest for certain domains. So it is it's strongest for lullabies and dance songs. Lullabies and dance songs seem especially stereotyped in their forms across societies. They are very similar and people are really good. You know, you can go to, for instance, Mentawe and play them a Punjabi. We didn't play them a Punjabi, but you can play them like an Indian lullaby and they are pretty good at recognizing it. Um, we found these associations in other domains, but they were much weaker. And so, for instance, love songs. It, people seem to sing songs about love all over the world. And there, there seems to be some signal, um, but that signal is, is much less strong. And, you know... We, in one of our earlier experiments, we didn't even find that people could reliably identify love songs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I mentioned that as one of the ways in which music is diverse. Um, there are certain functions that music can play, but, but those get instantiated differently. And what actually seems to be the case is that for something like a love song, it's less the musical features that are, that are doing the work and more the lyrics. Um, mm -hmm. And you also studied infant directed songs, right? And how they differ from other domains of song. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. So there is, in the analysis that I just talked about, the infant directed songs are these lullabies, uh, whereas the other forms of song are um, the dance songs, etc. And so like I was saying, the infant-directed songs are especially stereotyped. Um, they tend to be slower. They tend to be less accented. So a dance song, for instance, might be like, Ricard, oh, wait, <laughs> like, the dog, or, this is a, a sentence that's very accented. The dog went to the zoo. And here's a sentence that has far fewer accents. The dog went to the zoo. Um, so lo like infant-directed song is less accented it's slower, uh, it's less fast. Yeah, so those were some of the consistent features that unified them. Mm -hmm. And uh, since music is a human universal, uh, do we know something about its biological foundation? So, for example, in religion, we know several different cognitive mechanisms that allow for religion to exist, like, for example, the hyperactive agency detection device, folk biology, folk psychology, folk physics, and things like that. Do we know of any set of cognitive traits or mechanisms that allow for uh, for us to uh, create, express, and transmit music and enjoy music in general? 
Yeah. So um, there is this long-standing question of how much of our capacity for music, pardon, how much of our capacity for music comes from biological adaptations or cognitive adaptations that exist for other purposes and how many or to what extent are the biological or cognitive foundations designed for music in particular. So Steven Pinker, for example, has proposed what he calls the cheesecake or that music is auditory cheesecake. Um, so it sounds like you're familiar where he lays out what he thinks are the, the, the cognitive biological building blocks. Um, and I think there's good evidence that at least some of the ones he builds up or he points out um, are, did evolve for, for ends aside from music, but are co-opted for music. So the, the clearest one is language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, music has phrases, it's organized hierarchically in a way that's similar to language. And you find that if you, for instance, play music for someone, you see language uh, regions of the brain light up, but then if you splice it and you reorder it, and then you play for it, those regions don't don't light up. So there seems to actually be some of the interpretation of music that is using um, neurobiological mechanisms evolved for language. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that, that he has argued, he argues for, oh, and there's actually quite a bit of good evidence for this, auditory scene analysis. Are you familiar with auditory scene analysis? Uh, no, could you explain it? So we seem to have this suite of um, like cognitive neurobiological mechanisms for essentially figuring out what the auditory world is and looks like. So, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm sitting, I'm getting, I'm getting, at the moment I'm not getting so much auditory information, but you know, there's a bird, you probably can't hear it, there's a bird over there. I just heard the apartment door open. Sometimes there's a car goes by, a car goes by. There's all kinds of auditory information coming in and vibrating my eardrum. And now my brain has to figure out what are those auditory objects? Where are they coming from? Which, which vibrations or which sounds go together, you know, maybe they're harmonics, or which ones should we disentangle, which should we consider as different voices. There's this whole suite of cognitive mechanisms for parsing the auditory world. And there's an argument that some pretty core features of how we perceive music um, are incidental consequences of this, this suite of cognitive adaptations. So Laurel Trainer has argued that a lot of how we perceive pitch is actually an incidental consequence of auditory scene analysis. Um, yeah, so those are some of the arguments for um, biological adaptations that evolved for other ends, understanding sound, understanding language, that have been co-opted for um, music. Um, but then there are some, like my co-author, some people like my co-author Sam Mayer, who argue that beyond just the these other biological adaptations there are parts of our brain there are parts of the music faculty that have evolved specifically for producing and, and parsing music um mm -hmm. there's some suggestive evidence but it's like right now kind of hard to know if to what extent those are that's accurate so Josh McDermott and MIT has shown that there are certain parts of the brain that respond very targeted to music, um, but it's unclear whether you know we're learning that or whether that's more built in by biological evolution. Um, Sam has argued, and this tells us less about, at least the part of his proposal that I remember tells us less about the uh, actual biological building blocks, but Sam argues that lullaby in particular, infant-directed song, my colleague Sam Mayer, and my other colleague Max Krasnow argued together, that infant-directed song is a signal of attention, that, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent and my child wants, like, an assurance that I'm around before it falls asleep. It doesn't want to be eaten by a tiger. And so lullabies are designed uh, very effectively to signal attention from the parent to the child. I'm here. I'm paying attention to you. You don't have to worry. The entire structure of the lullaby, the argument goes, um, is serving that function. Mm -hmm. But that is the, the kind of classic dichotomy in these biological explanations of music. Is it a byproduct? Is it an adaptation? Mm -hmm. But, but uh, 
does the evidence point toward one more than the other or I'm, i mean is there more evidence for music being a byproduct or for it being an adaptation or yeah so i would say it really depends on who you ask um so what i would say is that it's clear that certain aspects of the music faculty are using parts of cognition or parts of the brain that evolved for other purposes, language, auditory scene analysis. Um, the fact that humans everywhere produce music, that they do it in pretty stereotyped ways, that you know they produce, they dance, they sing lullabies, raises this question of, of whether um, it, it's it really, and the extent to which we invest in, in producing and consuming music leads some people to believe that that is strong evidence or suggestive evidence that it's a, an adaptation. But, you know, as we've been talking about, religion is ubiquitous and clearly costly. And I don't think, I think most cognitive scientists of religion will argue that it's not a genetic adaptation. Um, so I would say the jury's out. Um, <laughs> there are two papers coming out in behavioral and brain sciences that propose different evolutionary arguments for music and I know that that will fu fuel a lot of discussion a lot of commentary so maybe we can see in about a year and a half what people think yeah yeah great and uh, okay so j just one last question and still regarding music because there's also this hypothesis that was put forth by Geoffrey Miller if I'm not mistaken in the mating mind where he basically argues that the different kinds of art that people developed including music would serve a function of attracting uh, mates or potential mates so uh, but um, as far as i know and please correct me if i'm wrong uh, music at least in traditional societies like hunter gatherers or horticulturalists and so on uh, it is basically uh, something that people, uh, it's basically a, a collective uh, phenomenon, that is, it is not one single person singing usually, but it's, pers it's people from the same group gathering together to produce music and to dance and sing together and things like that. So uh, is, the, is that correct or, or not? Well, it's both. So I mentioned that there are these three dimensions of music that we found. One of them is what we call formality. Mm -hmm. um, so, our, oh wait, okay. Actually, I think that, well, I'm trying to remember the dimensional structure, but essentially what we found when we did this analysis is that across cultures you find, um, you know, music produced by a single singer for a single audience member, even music produced by a single singer for themselves. And then you also find very often across societies, music produced in collective groups among people of the same sex who are not looking for, for reproductive interest from each other. Mm -hmm. um, so stuff that we d did and we haven't yet published is that we have also been working on a life history of music. So okay. across societies, how does music change and how it's used throughout the life course? Mm. Um, and the striking thing there is that music is not restricted to reproductive individuals. Music is used you know, from infancy to death, and it's used in very different, for very different social ends, depending on where you are in your life, whether it's ceremonial, initiation, play songs, you know, being put to sleep. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the sexual selection hypothesis for music uh, holds any water or, or I not? think that as a genetic, or the hypothesis that music is an adaptation for mate selection does not hold that much water i don't believe it um but i think like humans are flexible and we are pretty competent at using any behavior at our disposal uh in mating markets to signal underlying traits so i definitely think people use music to attract mates but i also think people use like impersonating presidents to attract mates i think they use like what kinds of shoes they wear to, to attract mates. Humans are flexible signalers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, j just before we finish, uh, 
Uh, just it, it came to my mind now one hypothesis that is uh, until very recently in our revolutionary history we didn't have the kinds of music that we have nowadays in concerts where there's a single band and a single vo uh, a single person pr uh, singing to a huge crowd of people until very recently that didn't happen so couldn't it also be the case that the reason why nowadays if we study uh, singers for example they usually have a much higher number of sexual partners during their lifetime than uh, you and common people let's say uh, because uh, not because of the music they produce but because of their popularity for example couldn't that be an alternative yeah, yeah. hypothesis yeah i mean i think i don't think it's a great research design looking at the reproductive benefits or the reproductive success of pop singers in contemporary society and using that to inform evolutionary hypotheses about music for many reasons including the one you just listed that the that is a very peculiar form of performing music yeah yeah and it's a very recent one evolutionarily speaking and i mean it only occurs in uh, modern industrialized but basically almost <laughs> weird societies only right so yeah right yeah. Uh, okay so dr sink uh, let's end the interview here it was uh, really fun talking to you just before we go would you like to mention the best places on the internet for people to find your work oh yeah so they can visit my website manvir.org m-a-n-v-i-r dot org and they can also visit my twitter um and if you just search my name manvir singh you should find it if you google like manvir singh twitter harvard it'll probably pop up and do you have your articles in your website open for okay can, I do. can people access them directly yeah, I have PDFs of all of them okay. on my website. Okay, okay. So I will include all of that in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. It's a very interesting work. And again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It, and it was a real pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thank you a lot, Ricardo. This was a lot of fun. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klingpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingarten, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.